Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2 Super Mini Mail Call today. And the first package is from, well, I'm not sure. It doesn't say on the outside of the box. So let's see what's inside this package. Alrighty, I see some snack goodies here. Ooh, what's this? Matzo balls? And we have what feels like a small computer. And there's a note at the bottom of the box. All right, let's check out the note here. Ooh, it's all handwritten. And this package comes from Jacob. And it says, Dear Adrian, enclosed is this strangely modified Timex Sinclair 2068 computer. Jacob and I discussed this via email a little while back. And uh, yeah, this belonged to, I think he said his brother. And yes, he says, as I mentioned, my brother modified this with a ZX Spectrum ROM and some kind of magnetic switch to change from the TS-2068 to the Spectrum mode. And in case you are watching this and not familiar, the Timex Spectre, or sorry, the Timex Sinclair 2068 is the US NTSC version of the ZX Spectrum that was really, really popular in the UK and in Europe. That machine over there was only ever released as a PAL machine. But over here, this Timex version, which looks different when we unwrap it here, you'll see it does looks quite different than the, uh, the version from overseas, um, didn't sell very well. And it also wasn't really compatible with the ZX Spectrum software, not directly, I think because there were some ROM differences. So it was a very common modification, as Jacob mentioned here, to switch the ROMs in the Timex version here to use the ZX Spectrum ROMs, because I think for the most part, otherwise, like hardware wise, these are the same. He goes on to say he remembers using this as an unmodified machine. It's pretty much his first computer that he ever used. And he has many fond memories of loading games from tape on the 2068 and spending hours on them. Some of my favorites were Manic Miner, Jet Set Willy, and 3D Death Chase. And Zadom, I think it says there. Not familiar with that one. He goes on to say that there was a bunch of software that he's not sure what happened to it. And of course, even the power supply and all that stuff is missing, but that's not a problem. And of course, he has no idea if this machine works. And yes, I think he sent me some photos of this. And it does have some strange modifications that his brother did. And he says he's included a package of matzo ball mix. The Jewish mother's dirty secret, as you had mentioned that you hadn't had matzo ball soup in a long time. And that's right. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles. So of course I had access to Jewish delis that were nearby. In fact, the high school I went to was just up the street from Cantor's on Fairfax. And basically, uh, yeah, you know, on a cold rainy day, nothing beats some really yummy matzo ball soup, I gotta say. Jacob says he would have happily sent a jar of his soup made with his mother's recipe, but he thinks shipping soup <laughs> is really a bad idea. And yeah, you know what? This isn't going to go bad in the box. I've, I've had this now. Um, I think this arrived. Where's the? I don't know. This, this has been in the basement for a while now. So soup in a jar um, probably would have gone bad. If anyone ships me something in a mail call item that has perishable stuff in it, please write on the side of the package like perishable or food or something like that, like to clue me in that I shouldn't just let that sit for a long time. If it's something like this, that's like just packaged up, um, that's shelf stable, especially down in the basement where it's nice and cool all the time, like 20, 21 degrees Celsius, around 69, 70 degrees, um, that's gonna, it's gonna last for a while. And at the end of the letter, he just says, thanks for all the entertainment on YouTube, uh, Jacob. So yeah, thanks, Jacob. Okay, well, let's, uh, I have never actually seen one of these Timex machines firsthand. Of course, I have lots of Timex Sinclair 1000 uh, machines, which is the ZX, what is that? The ZX81, I think this is what that is. Let me see how to open this carefully where I don't want to cut into the computer itself. So yeah, I, I have a couple of the ZX81 machines, so the Timex Sinclair 1000 with RAM expansions, and I think there's a printer and stuff like that. And then of course I do have uh, an actual ZX Spectrum, and I have uh, some of the later Spectrums as well, things that I need to get to working on and trying to repair. But this Timex machine is just a little bit more rare because of course the whole NTSC nature of it now, what I'm curious about is when you run a game that was designed for the ZX Spectrum and 50 Hertz, does it run too fast or too slow? What is it? Uh, fast, right? It will be faster at 60 Hertz, or is there really no difference because 
games designed for this machine don't lock to the vertical sync like they do on other machines, like the 64 or uh, Amiga and stuff like that. Look at that. It's actually in not too terrible shape. Um, it has a similar keyboard to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. I should go grab one. Um, except that the keys are actually plastic and they're not that rubber type that are on the ZX. But I'm pretty sure the layout is essentially identical. And the only thing that's sort of coming up here is um, this sticker or whatever's around the keys. It's like peeling up a little bit and actually feels like it's metal, like it is on the ZX Spectrum. Uh, it's bigger than the ZX. The ZX Spectrum is, I don't think it's even as wide as the keyboard, but then this has uh, this extra thing on the side here, which I think is like a cartridge slot. I think you just lift this up. There it is. Oh, little bits of something in there. All right, there it is. This is like a ROM game cartridge slot, which the ZX Spectrum didn't even have. It had the, the rear parallel port expansion connector, which is right here. You'd plug in the printer and other types of expansion devices, joystick ports and things like that into here. But I guess they decided for the North American market it was somehow important enough that you'd have some kind of game cartridges that plugged in there. Well, on the side of the machine, there looks like a joystick port. I don't really know because the ZX Spectrum never had a joystick port. It was always an external device you need to plug in. On the back, there's that connector I already talked about. There's the a monitor connector, which I assume is composite because right here it says TV. So that must be RF, power, earphone, and microphone. So that's for plugging in your cassette player thing, whatever you want to call it. And then on this side, there's another port. So like two built-in joysticks. And then we have the power switch right here. Awesome. Okay, and then flipping this around, these are the modifications that Jacob mentioned. There's a hole here cut in the bottom of the machine, but yet it doesn't look like there's a switch or any reason for that in particular. Now he told me that from his recollection, his brother basically used a reed switch inside this to probably switch between two different address lines on the ROM. And you used a magnet to put this near here to like affect that reed switch from my understanding. He does have a sticker right here that says Spectrum and TS 68. Um, I don't know what would normally be there. I guess nothing. But yeah, he said there was like a, a magnet to, to switch the mode. And I'm assuming it fit in this gap here. And I guess um, we're going to have to open this thing up and take a look inside and see if we can see that for ourselves. Oh, and incidentally, here is my Timex ZX Spectrum here. Um, it has some nice parts on here that make it look nice, like this dust cover, which I got from ZX Renew over in the UK. And this machine itself, I actually imported myself on a business trip while I was in the UK. I found this on eBay and had it sent to our office at the company I worked for at the time, and then basically filled up my suitcase with machines like this, BBC Micros and whatnot. But this thing looks freaking brand new now, and that's because it was in pretty rough shape. But from ZX Renew, I got a brand new metal cover here, so peeled off the old one. I think I replaced the keyboard membrane, which was problematic, and then put this new cover on. So this thing looks perfect. The ZX Spectrum almost fits in just the size of this keyboard. Does this keyboard feel better than this one? Not really. There is an actual space bar here, and the space bar is over here on the right. Well, that's not ideal. And then the enter key is wider there. Pretty much everything else looks exactly the same except for the fact that there is a space bar, and I guess you can push it anywhere. Anyhow, okay, um, so ZX Spectrum for power has a nine volt DC input. Now I think it's just a voltage regulator, which means you can give it like from 7.5 volts up and it has uh, things to generate the different voltage rails or whatever that are needed inside of this machine. So my assumption is, is this machine probably works in exactly the same way. It doesn't say anything about the voltage on the back here though. It does say right here, no user serviceable parts inside and use a Timex approved AC adapter and it is made in Korea. Okay, so how about before we turn this on, let's do the old Dave Jones thing and let's take it apart. My terrible Australian accent there. Let's see what we can find inside. There's a missing screw there. Like I said, I've never even touched one of these machines, let alone taken one apart. But I'm assuming it has a membrane keyboard, much like the other one. So I need to be very careful on disassembly. The screws seem a little 
randomized. <laughs> like, uh, in fact, it's funny, this plate almost looks like it's separate here. This, this part with this line, maybe it's not. There we go, it's starting to come apart. Let's look very carefully in there. Yeah, it definitely has a membrane keyboard. It's right there. Let's get this keyboard unplugged. Oh, screw just came out. Put that there. There's some parts floating around inside the machine as well. So I'm just gonna very carefully lift the keyboard connector out of there. There we go. Okay, there it is, it's freed. So we flip this over. Ooh, yeah, that's in kind of rough shape already. Although, um, that's intriguing. This ribbon cable appears to have a connector here and also on the motherboard, so that's different. Maybe this uses a PCB, it does have a PCB there. So that is really cool because it would be possible to replace this, not to mention I could just take that connector off and actually solder uh, wires and put a connector on the motherboard here to stop using this potentially sketchy ribbon cable. Okay, there it is, <laughs> look at that. Neat, uh, here's something that was floating around inside. What, what the heck is that? Looks like a little brass insert, plastic thing. Okay, so let's take a look at what's going on in here. This is way more integrated than it is on the ZX Spectrum. So right here's the Z80 CPU. We have a Timex Computer Corporation IC here, which um, seems to kind of combine the majority of the logic into this one IC. And it says made by NCR here. So not Ferranti as it is on the ZX Spectrum. We have a ROM IC here, I guess. It says uh, Sinclair on it. Then we have this board here, which says ROM switch by Russell Electronics. And then I don't really get what's going on here. Like, shouldn't there be two chips in here? This appears to be the original Sinclair ROM right there. But I'm thinking this would be the ZX Spectrum one. And then, uh, what is going on with these wires here? Like something was in here and it's been removed. I'm assuming whatever like magnetic switch might have existed is gone. But I'm still confused as why was this cut out under here, like where the keyboard connector is, when the ROM stuff is over here and it was actually underneath, if I grab this, notice right here, I wonder if this is where you held the magnets to switch modes. And maybe there was like some kind of a read switch that was happening on that little board. Now it does look like this board is in a socket. So I can pop that out, there you go. And it does seem to be a commercial product here. What is this? I don't know, this is definitely something that's aftermarket as well. It's plugged into a socket. It's got a couple extra ICs on it. Part number 335-80006. This whole thing is very bodge-tastic, like these thick bodge wires here that just... Is that original? I'd love to hear from people who are familiar with these machines and can tell me were actual machines from Timex coming with these large bodge wires and then this like shielded orange cable here that goes to the cartridge connector and then over here to this large, uh, we'll call it a ULA again. Now the actual ZX Spectrum has 48K of RAM. Um, that's the max configuration. There's, I think you can get it in like a 16K as well. And it basically has one bank of memory that is 16K or 41 16 chips, the same type used in like the Commodore PET, the ones that need plus 12 volts, plus five volts and minus five volts. And then there is a second bank in the, this is the real ZX Spectrum, where they use 64K chips, but half of the chip is bad. So basically, uh, Clive Sinclair was able to buy these chips cheaper from the RAM manufacturers where they were binned that they still mostly worked, but only half of the bank worked. These would normally be chips that were rejected because if you tried to put them in a Commodore 64, they would test as bad. But the motherboard only used half of the memory in the ZX Spectrum. And I think I remember that there's a jumper to configure whether it's using the top half of the chip or the bottom half of the chip because certain batches of chips had a bad bottom half and other ones a bad top half. Of course, you could just use a normal 64K chip in those motherboards and it works just fine, but you're only using half of those. Now on this machine, it does appear that they've used this later 44 or 16 chip. So two chips here is 16K, two chips here is 16K, and two chips here are 16K. So that's the way they got 48K on this particular motherboard. They could have easily just used two 64K chips and just ignored that top 16K, but they chose to do it this way. 
Now, unlike the original ZX Spectrum as well, this is more like the later Spectrums and it has an AY sound chip here. Looks like it's an AY3-8912. So that's like a square wave generator chip. There may be three voices, something like that. So you have some like Tandy 1000 slash PC Junior like sound. There is a built-in speaker, but the sound also can come out of the RF modulator, if I recall. Now, unlike the original Zadek Spectrum, none of these RAM chips require the minus five volts and plus 12 volts. So I'm sure that this just uses a normal like DC input of some kind. Looks like there's a voltage regulator here. So maybe it's nine volts or something like that. Probably what I'm gonna do is I will start at five volts, check the voltage on these chips. Five volts through a voltage regulator is gonna result in like three point something volts. So I'll definitely be able to tell for sure that there is a regulator because I don't want to give this thing too much voltage if there is no regulator and it just requires a straight five volts. Of course, since I took this ROM board out, which actually incidentally has a bent pin there, that, that means this machine will not do anything. Now, I think what I probably need to do is just remove this ROM chip from this little adapter board and stick it right back in the motherboard. That way that kind of returns this back to, you know, stock. All right, there we go, the ROM chip is out. Now, one of the legs, if I can get this to focus, is missing, and it looks like it was bent up and it was attached to one of these wires here. That's probably, I don't know, an address line or, or something. Luckily, there's enough left of it, like it was ripped off here, that I can just grab another leg off a dead chip and actually reconnect that up. I'll solder that on, and it should be able to make this, this work again. Now, ultimately, I would like to have a ROM switcher in this thing so I could switch back and forth between the stock ROM and the uh, ZX Spectrum ROM, but I can use something a little bit more modern than this and a little bit less, uh, I don't know, sketchy with all these wires and stuff here. So to do a leg transplant, I'm just gonna take this bad, whatever RAM chip here, and we're gonna remove one of the legs from it, and we'll just do it by bending that back and forth several times, which takes it right off just like that. And it's as simple as reattaching the leg. If I can get the tweezers to work, and these tweezers are junk. Okay, there we go. It may look like crap, but it should do the trick. Okay, here, let's see. Are all the legs looking okay? They are indeed. So this should go back in there. There it is. All right, well, I found an article here. To, it seems to imply that DC 14 to 25 volts, and then that is regulated down to plus 20, or that's not regulated, uh, plus five, plus 12 in ground. It says the 12 volt regulation is a 28L12 series regulator, while the five volt regulator is a switching supply using a 28S40. I, I don't see either of those on here. It does, these pots here say VR2, VR1, and VR3, so that implies that adjusting those does change some voltage regulation on here. All right, well, I don't know. I'm just gonna give this, I guess, 15 volts off the bench supply, and I'll just connect the multimeter up to one of these RAM chips here so we can monitor uh, the voltage. I'd like to figure out the polarity of the DC input here. So I have this little cable here. So I'm hooked up to the negative line here, which on this is the outside. And when I plug this in, we don't actually have even a good connection here. That's interesting. And that appears to be ground because it's also on the shield right here of uh, this video jack. Uh, the thing is, while that's working, so I was definitely center negative, I don't seem to have a connection to the, uh, the other outside sleeve or the, uh, the positive in the case of this thing here. I'm gonna need to try to scratch up. Maybe I'll use this X-Acto blade. Uh, the little contact in there just seems like it's corroded. All right, and that made the difference because I now have 0.49 ohms there. Uh, so this is definitely center negative on this jack. So I need to connect the power supply positive to this black wire here. All right, so the power supply leads here are in my left hand. Uh, the output is off right now. So we're just connecting this together and having to invert it because of course that uh, whole center negative thing, which is annoying. So I have two clips connected to the RAM. This top left one, or top right one, I'm sorry, this pin right here, this is the ground pin. And then that is the voltage pin, five volts right there. So we'll connect this up, set the multimeter to volts. There we go, you should be able to read that. Okay, the power switch I think is on here. And I'm gonna turn on the bench power supply. 
Uh, we're getting nothing. Zero current draw. This must be off. Whoa. Well, it's making a hissing noise, but did you see there? We're getting uh, 4.99 volts. What is hissing over here? Something in this regulation circuit is making a hissing noise. Hmm. And what is next to do is get the video hooked up. I gotta wake the whole computer up here. Let's hook up video to this thing and let's see if it works. It may just be working or it totally may not be working. All right, Retro Tink is up and here we go. Well, look, Sinclair Research. <laughs> it freaking works. Now, does this need more voltage? Is that why this is making that noise? Let's turn it up a little bit. No, it's making weird sounds, but if I turn it down, it sounds to be happier right now. So it's at 12 volts right now, and the image is looking better. It had a little, um, let me adjust the camera there, had a little bit of interference in it, and the hissing is less out of this. Let's keep going down. Oh, now there's no hissing at all, so we are at nine volts. I don't know that article I was reading, must not have been accurate, and it was struggling with the regulation, and now um, it looks nice and good. So let's power cycle this again. Look at that, NTSC, I love it. I freaking love it. All right, I think I gotta try to hook up this keyboard now, right? Um, so we can see if we can type something. Ho ho, yes. So let's see, 10. My ability to use this is really not great. Print, I'm looking for quote, there it is. How do I get to that shift? Nope, that's not it. Delete, is that this a function key here? Nope. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Print. No, that gives me a P. I do not know. There it is. Okay, it's that key. It's a little worn off, so there's no legend there. Adrian Black. Oh, look, it has lowercase. Fancy. Adrian. Oh, boy, this keyboard. Wow. I mean, I assume you get used to it, but all these weird key combos. Oh, I put shift in one, and that cleared the line. Oh, wow. Let's try that again. Shift, Adrian Black was here. And I think I have to use this key to get an exclamation point, and I do. Exclamation, enter, there it is, 20, go to 10. And now we hit run. There it is, Adrian Black was here. Scroll, yes. <laughs> well, on first appearance, this thing appears to work. That is awesome. I am trying to figure out how to change the color. I think it's this ink command here. No, not that. They overloaded all these keys where like the one X key is exponent, clear, pound symbol, and ink. It's like four different things. And there aren't that many modifier keys. There's like a shift key and then there's another one. So let's see, if I push that, I get the pound symbol. If I push that plus shift, seems to switch between the lower and then the E. Oh, there it is. Wow, that's confusing. So I have to push shift the modifier and let go, and then you push that key, and then, no, that gave me exponent. Ah, oh, modifier, and then push shift and that, and then I get ink. Okay, there we go. Okay, now I put like ink three. This is really hard. <laughs> Hello there. Okay, now I'll try that. Nope. Printed, Adrian Black was there, and then hello there is in like a darker gray. But I thought I had done three, which would be magenta. But everything is this like light gray color now. So I'd say that some additional repairs are required of this thing. It's possible that the color carrier frequency is off right now. It is interesting to see this in NTSC mode though, I gotta say. Uh, at nine volts, it's currently running at 365 milliamps or so. So relatively low, um, low current draw. Let's lift this off. I do see what looks like an adjustable um, capacitor right here, and maybe that adjusts the clock frequency for the color signal. I just brought up the oscilloscope. Let's uh, let's connect up to the video signal here. Unplug it there, and let's see if we can see what that clock signal or what that color clock is. What you have here is all these dips. That is the horizontal scan. And then you have this every 60th of a second uh, where it's basically doing a vertical sync pulse. And normally 
you would have essentially right here, like, or somewhere around here, you'd get the color burst. And that's what tells the decoder that you're actually running in color. And if we zoom in here, what we see there are basically uh, all white background. So black border, white background. And then we have these drops here, which are letters. You can see they're up at the top, but most of the screen is blank right now, which is why it's mostly blank but I don't see any color burst. So I am not sure if this thing's had some kind of a mod or something that has removed the color output on it or what the deal is. Oh, I suppose it's possible that that video output connector is monochrome. I mean, why? Why would it be that way though? Alrighty, well, anyways, I think that's gonna be enough for this mail call episode. I'm definitely gonna have to dig back into this machine. I am gonna write on the back of the machine though that this is center negative and nine volts DC is the correct input for this and that it does work. And actually the nice thing is, is this uh, keyboard does work as well, which is not super common for ZX Spectrums at least. Those keyboards seem to fail like at record numbers. Also, it's kind of cool that there's a uh, yellowing on the back here, but this painted plastic is very unyellowed. Of course the keys are, uh, this should clean up, you know, to some extent. It will never be perfect. And I think this machine will look pretty nice. So I'm going to ask my viewers who are watching this video now to please put comments down below and tell me more about this machine. Like, are these built-in joystick ports and are they, what, Kempton standard or what the deal is there? Does this have color output on this composite connector here? Or is it monochrome? Why am I only seeing monochrome on the oscilloscope there? Is there any reason for me not to swap the ROM permanently with the ZX Spectrum ROM just to make this an NTSC ZX Spectrum? And then the other question I had earlier was, do games that were designed for the ZX Spectrum run quicker on this due to the frame rate difference? Or are games on this mostly just locked to your clock speed so it doesn't really matter the frame rate of the video? I remember seeing that there were cartridges that were released for this, and maybe that was one of the problems with switching over to the ZX Spectrum ROM, is it does not work with this cartridge anymore. It like ignores that part of the ROM space, so it won't actually execute the cartridges if they're inserted. But I don't have any cartridges, so it doesn't really matter. And finally, I should definitely run some further diagnostics on this, which will be in a future video. I'm pretty sure there's a diagnostic ROM you can get for the ZX Spectrum, which obviously should work in here, I, I hope at least, that runs a full battery of diagnostics like RAM checks and video checks, sound checks, uh, joystick ports, stuff like that. So I'm gonna have to look for that. But yeah, please, uh, anyone who knows about this or what the deal is, comment down below. It's funny how this just was not successful in the US, even though the ZX Spectrum was incredibly successful in the UK with so many games coming out for it. And primarily that was because it was so much less expensive than the Commodore 64, for instance. So it just, even though like this keyboard is very difficult to use until you get used to it, it was just a very successful machine. So yes, thank you very much, Jacob, for sending this in. I really appreciate it. I hope it gives you a smile to uh, see it at least working to some extent already. And uh, you know, I removed this ROM bodge here because it looks like whatever was in here before for magnetism is long gone. There's no longer anything left of that. So yeah, I am curious, like what happened to the, edit the other ROM chip? It must have been taken out and salvaged and stuck into something else. Yeah, I'm very curious about that. Anyhow, so that is gonna be that. Thanks, Jacob, again, for sending this in and the uh, matzo ball soup mix here. Thanks to all my patrons. Their names are scrolling off the side of the screen. I very much appreciate that support. And thanks for watching. Thumbs up, comment down below, all the usual YouTube stuff. Subscribe will really help me on the second channel. And that is going to be that. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.